This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Thank you very much for uh, letting me the chance uh, to uh, to speak here, and it's uh, it's quite I must say quite emotional to come back after these four years, especially after this. Uh, Two years of uh, of this pandemic and, uh, and and this inability to to travel and to see some colleagues and it's it really feels good to um, to to be back in the INS. So today the 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 work I'm going to uh, to present to you is uh, actually a work that I've been doing for my habitation. So this is this diploma we have in French and other countries in Europe that give you the right to be a a PhD director, um, and it was the chance for me to put together pretty much all the work that I've been doing this last 20 years uh, in Egypt on the material uh, of Ptolemaic coins and early Roman coins, and that was I'm going to uh, produce there. Um, I'm going to, okay, I'll try to, sorry, the tab doesn't work. Sorry, Alan. Let's use this. Ah, okay. Sorry, I did. Yeah, to show up. Okay. Mm, that should work. We may have to do just that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll okay. do that. Yeah, like sorry. That. Thank you very much. Um, so, of course, and I, I put that for um, for Peter. There was there were coinage uh, before the Ptolemies in Egypt and. Uh, you have these famous uh, owls that were circulating broadly in Egypt and were also uh, minted locally with this imitation that were well known from uh, from the Persian Persian period. Give you an idea that we often consider that the the, the start of the, Ptole the Ptole start of the coinage in Egypt is the Ptolemies, but there were uh, coinage before. There were also uh, gold coins that were struck. Uh, one uh, unique coin that you see on on the left, um, and this famous coinage with the hieroglyph the hieroglyph Nubnefer on the on the coins of Nectanebo the, the second that were struck uh, before the before the, the Ptolemies, and of course uh, the use of Alexander coinage. For those that are not really uh, familiar for the of the Ptolemaic coinage and the and the Roman coinage of Egypt. Uh, we're speaking um, at the beginning of the Ptolemaic coinage, at the very end of the of the fourth century BC, when uh, Alexander died and Ptolemy took over uh, the land and took over for almost a century uh, wild territories uh, territories uh, between the Cyrenaica, so modern Libya, uh, Syria, and Phoenicia, and the south of uh, of modern Turkey. And expanded also to Greece uh, and Sicily for for some for some point, and of course Cyprus, uh, until the end of the and the death of Cleopatra in 31 BC. And for early Roman Egypt, my period of study starts with Augustus, um, and and at the end of the second uh, century under Commodus. So the question uh, that I set up for myself during this work at the uh, at this habilitation was uh, because the question was still uh, I mean need to to be answered. Did Roman Egypt was substantially more monetarized than Ptolemaic Egypt? For to understand this question, we have to go back and to understand also what are the collections of Egypt. So. Uh, I show on the left um, a very nice picture that I like really much of Giovanni, Giovanni Dattari, who was Italian collector and dealer, uh, working in uh, in Egypt, especially in Cairo, in the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20s, uh, is actually probably what was a, a large hoard of billion tetradrachma uh, on his desk and a famous also uh, objects that now are now in museums uh, on the background that you can see. The um, thing that is different uh, in Egypt and the rest of the Mediterranean is that you see on the right a graph of all the finds of, uh, of Roman hordes. Um, and it has been found through the 17th and 18th century until really recently. But if you take the graph on Egypt, you will see that most of the hordes 
were found from the, the very end of the 19th century and the first uh, half of the 20th century because there were these large excavation that took place uh, all over Egypt and of course a lot of material came out during this uh, this period so it's something that has to uh, to be uh, to be reminded the main problem is like most of these coins that were found as no provenance and were really not really known except the the, the collections that are in here in the INS in Paris, Berlin, uh, and London, for example. And I had the chance to work in the Egyptian Museum a few years ago and uh, to work with the, the curator of, uh, of coins, the curator of, of the museum, of the basement. And she told me that several boxes were full of coins in the basement. And when I start working on that, there was actually quite a lot of coins, actually 1.3 ton of coins in several boxes and so i was wondering where these coins were are coming from and uh, if you see the 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 text from maspero and pa and even in until the, the 50s like a lot of of uh, archaeologists or egyptians were founding a lot of coins in egypt but there were like a, very few people were paying attention to these coins so there were partly selling coins like gold and silver coins were sold by the Salle des Ventes in the Egyptian Museum. A lot of them went uh, to the greco roman Museum of Alexandria, who had the, the, at the time the, the best and still the best collections of coins in Egypt. And the rest, and there was one box with written scrap bronze on the top and uh, finished in the basement uh, of the Egyptian uh, Museum and was not discovered since. And I made a sample of these coins only by period, rough period, because a lot of them needs to be to be clean. And I came with the final number of 250,000 coins in these boxes. So you can imagine that there is still quite a lot of, uh, of work to be done. Fortunately, the rest of the collections were studied and uh, pay. I mean, some people pay attention to these coins. First, in the Bulak Museum, so the museum that were open in Cairo before the Egyptian Museum. museum Egyptian Museum in the Tahrir Square the, is open in 1902. Um, and you see uh, in this list the coins that were registered at the beginning. So you have both English and French mixed with a not d'intérêt, so the importance or the, the, the interest of the of the coins that were in number. But unfortunately, a lot of these coins have been sold or exchanged at that point because people were not really taking care of this. But you have in the record at least from the very beginning of, uh, of the Service des Antiquités, so in the 1860s and 70s, record of coins that were coming into the, into the collections. One very important thing to uh, to recall when we're studying the Ptolemaic and Roman coin in Egypt, Egypt is it's a closed monetary system. So, contrary to other uh, countries and and uh, and uh, empires in the kingdoms in the, this period, when you arrive to Egypt, you have to change your foreign coins to local coins. Uh, so we know that by this papyri. Uh, the Des Papyrus from the from the Zeon's Papyrus archive. It's probably, but we are not. We're discussing the this. Uh, we're discussing still that that is the head of the mint of Alexandria. That's asking uh, the coins to be changed, and he's speaking about these two very coins, uh, the coins of the Trichrison uh, that you can see uh, up there, and the Mnayon, which is the new coins that need to be uh, exchanged. Uh, on the new on the new system, so we knew that from this papyrus, and we know that from the excavation, that the, the monetary system was closed. And in fact, and we'll see that later, we found in Egypt mostly and very mostly coins struck by the Alexandrian mint. So we'll uh, just show you that for people that are not really aware of that the, the Ptolemaic coins, uh, the system which is made in gold for first with this uh, stator and um, uh, and and the trichrysa 
and then uh, Naeya with these different portraits of uh, Arsinoe, Ptolemy the first, Ptolemy the second, and Ptolemy the and Ptolemy the, the third. So very impressive coinage, but it's really well known. It has been uh, die studied by uh, by uh, uh, notably by uh, Julien Olivier and Cathy Lorbos, where we have amounts of and quantification of the of this coinage. Silver coinage took form um, in the uh, form of <coughs> tetradract. First on the Attic, uh, on the Attic um, uh, weight, so 17.2 grams. <coughs> Sorry. And on the second, uh, on the second phase, when the, the monetary system was closed, they moved to a system that was three grams. Uh, the, the tetradract was three drags. Uh, uh, lighter than the, the the attic one, which made three gram difference that was, that was taken by the state as a, um, as a profit. And you can see that is one one thing that is really different from other kingdoms of the Hellenistic period, that uh, the head of Ptolemy the first will stay along the time uh, until the, the the time of Cleopatra on the coins, even. If the even if the the portrait is changing and the portrait is becoming, I mean, Ptolemy the first is becoming um, younger and younger uh, when the the coinage is uh, is moving towards the end of the dynasty. Just to uh, to show you this, uh, the system of bronze is not linked directly to um, uh, to the reigns of the Ptolemies which all bear the same names, as you may know. Uh, and it has been divided uh, up to a series of up to 10. And you can see the dates there because I, I'm going to refer to this series during my, uh, during my, my uh, talk. So the bronze series were working with um, a number of denominations that were going in the third century uh, from these very large coins that were 100 grams, still a small coin to, uh, that was <clears throat> 2.5 grams. And what is funny on this uh, system, it says, of course, like most of the ancient coins, you had no value of, uh, on the coins, but the user were able to tell the value of the coin by the, the iconography. So once you can see that the, the, the eagle is, was uh, open wings, uh, the other time it's close wings, the time we have uh, Zeus Amon after it's a laureated Zeus or head of Alexander. So with all this subtle change in the iconography, people could understand what was the, 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 the denomination and the differentiate denomination uh, from the other. In the second century it differs a little bit and you have the, the new coins that appears and new iconography with this uh, Isis, Alexandria and Heracles. Um, appearing on coins and then at the very end you have this uh, these famous portrait coins of Cleopatra that are uh, quite famous uh, on which for the first time uh, for the Ptolemaic uh, period you have a value on the coins so it's the the letter that you see on the right side of the on the reverse for a mu for uh, for 40 and a p for uh, for 80 uh, drachm uh, which is very interesting is that Augustus, when he arrived, uh, he could have changed all the types and everything, and he did not. And the first coin that he struck were exactly the same types than the one of Cleopatra. He, of course, changed the portrait on the obverse for, for his, but he kept exactly the same design on the reverse with the same value, changing only uh, the, the legend on the reverse for, for his. On the early Roman coin in Egypt, there is a, a question that is still debated: is that if gold were circulating in the in Egypt, gold made in the rest of the empire, and even if uh, some really respected scholar think that it's the case, like Andrew Burnett, I'm still uh, thinking as Adriano Savio and Alessandro Cavagna uh, presented lately, that this coinage did not circulate in Egypt. We have different, uh, different uh, ori that are found in hordes in Egypt, but it's very few at the end, it's less than 10 hordes. 
uh, I show you these two coins because they are uh, coming. I was last week in Kelsey Museum in Ann Arbor. I think uh, Irene Sotomarin for that. And I had the chance to take the pictures of the Karanis hoard that was found, where you have these two uh, orei that are in the collection of the Kelsey uh, and that really nice coins, uh, these gold coins. But we have to think that gold Roman coins were not circulating in Egypt. So we are left with a, in a system with, on one side, the silver beyond coins. We call that beyond because it's a low content um, coin. So you have between, let's say, 30 and 20% 20 of, uh, of silver and the rest of copper. And the rest is a system of bronze, exactly the same, uh, the same that was existing during the Ptolemaic period with different, uh, with different denomination even if this denomination were not exactly existing at each uh, during each uh, emperors of course the the roman uh, coinage is more famous for it is really a rich iconography both in terms of uh, of animals and uh, and and um, and uh, divinities but you also have typical all uh, things from Egypt. You have one famous coin. I mean, uh, different famous coins with the with the pharaohs of Alexandria, represent of, of temples of Canopus, uh, Canopus, or a lot of this world. But I won't speak about that um, tonight. One of the, <clears throat> the other question that is debated is how the monetary system of the Roman Egypt is integrated to the into the empire. Um, of course, we have a closed monetary system, but it's not so exceptional because it was existing elsewhere, notably in Asia Minor. Um, you have the iconography is referring also to the history of the empire and to Latin legend, uh, the case that we found on this on these two very coins. There was cooperation between the mint of Alexandria and those of the rest of the empire. We know that for Pertinax, for example, where coins. Uh, were struck in the in the mint of Alexandria, and you have uh, contemporaneous reforms um, in the in the the rest of the empire in and in Egypt. But still, the study of the uh, Roman Egyptian coinage is still make on its own because most of the coins that we will find in Egypt are the coins struck by the mint of Alexandria. So the this question of the monetarization of Egypt came after I read this article made by um, uh, Eric Christiansen that uh, passed away now, but uh, we have been working extensively on uh, on Roman coinage of Egypt and Egypt, and he worked mostly on the on the hoards. And on this last uh, article, it's called "Mission Completed." So I think it was published in 2014, and is is writing on in his article roman egypt seems much more monetized than its ptolemaic predecessor and that was a question for me and for my experience uh, it was not the case but i needed to put data on this very uh, on this very sentence the first thing that i saw is that we work with um, uh, with andrew meadows and Cathy lorba on a, on a volume called egyptian hordes that were um, uh, listing and publishing new hordes of the ptolemaic period for the roman period still needs to be done and the data that um, that christiansen was giving in his uh, in his article was really far from the data that i had, had collected and you see what uh, Christiansen is giving. There is a little bit more gold hoards. There are a substantial number of silver hoards, but the, the wealth of new hoards are coming from the bronze. And I think it will be the, the same case from an Egy Roman Egypt that bronze hoards will come out a, a lot more and we will have more data on, on bronze coins. So with this new data, I had the feeling that there was something that needed to be done. So first, with the study of uh, of, um, of Egyptian hordes, um, the data we have to remind that the data is relatively scarce. So, for example, we have more hordes in Burgundy for the second and third century than for Egypt during six centuries. 
So we have only for Roman and, uh, and Ptolemaic Egypt about 200 hordes for the territory of Egypt, which is really not much. And the data, it's problematic because it doesn't cover the whole spectrum of the of the period. It's more, let's say, coherent and uh, and significant for uh, the Ptolemaic period. But you see for the Roman period that you have big gaps for which you don't have uh, bureau dates and you don't have hordes for this period. So we are coming with segmented data that needs to be fixed. Of course, hordes can be uh, can be interesting. I just show you a few examples, but there could be many more. So you have this horde found in Karnak, so the temple of Karnak in Luxor that was found in this uh, in this house uh, in the in '69. It uh, consists of 40 kilos of coins of bronze coins. You see, it was kept apparently in a bag, and it was uh, found like this in the in excavation. And it's really interesting because it's it was uh, there were coins like this, these really large Ptolemaic coins from the third centuries, and it it was found in a place where uh, the um, the priests were keeping their saving, and apparently this hoard was kept uh, as probably a receipt for tax payments or thing like this, and was discarded at the moment that they didn't need coinage, and we know that this exact period, uh, the Theban revolt arrived. So there was separation between South and North Egypt and the, the Ptolemaic, Ptolemies lost control of South South Egypt. And apparently this horde was discarded uh, at that period. We also have to remind that uh, a lot of hordes of bronze coins, we found them in that state of preservation, which is bad um, and but for example these coins uh, from the series nice have like dozens and dozens of these hordes that were discarded and unfortunately because the coins can't be conserved or or are too numerous in the excavation they are not studied not conserved so we don't have any information about that and it's only the past let's say 15 years that I really found that there were a lot of these coins and that must mean something for the monetary circulation. I just saw this uh, coin mold that was found in Tanis uh, a very while ago that showed that most of these coins were actually not produced by the Alexandrian mint, but by, let's say, uh, imitation uh, local mints within the country. And it's debated if it's it's clearly not under the control of the of the state, but there were a way that they were working and the state knew about the, the production of, of the, those coins. So the sample I worked on, the work I've done is just I registered all the coins found in excavation from the 19th century to nowadays. Uh, so it comes with 72 sites. I put also, uh, I'm responsible for about a dozens of sites on which I'm working as a numismatist. So I have data from this uh, from these sites as well. You see that you have data from pretty much everywhere in Egypt from now from the Delta to Fayum to the South of Egypt. And it comes, the database now, it's about 6,000 Ptolemaic coins and 200, uh, uh, 2,000, uh, 200 Roman coins. Of course, as expected for excavation coins, it's mostly copper coins uh, and very few beyond coins and almost no silver and, and of course, no gold. Uh, we can um, separate this, uh, this data during the, I mean, with this, um, with this uh, 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 things, the number are not completely, uh, I mean, not complete, but give you a rough idea that is not, uh, I mean, depending on series, the number are, are different, and it's also the case for the for the Roman uh, for the Roman period. Um, uh, on this hoard as well, this was a, a hoard of Cleopatra that was, was found in the seventies, and it's also interesting uh, in terms of um, in terms of data because it gives us um, the moment where they put copper into the silver coins and where silver coins were used more as let's say beyond even bronze coins and 
we start to find them in excavation, which was not the case before. And it's exactly the case for the for the coins uh, within the during the Roman period, where do you have these coins in excavation with low value uh, low value silver, and you uh, see one coin that were found recently uh, by the um, by the Roger Bagnor uh, excavation, and Pauli Davoli was a field director in Ameida in the oasis of uh, of Tarla. So what I did, I also work on the distribution of coins. Uh, this map show you that on a very, very few sites, you find coins from else, elsewhere, from outside Egypt. Uh, but you also found very, very little coins struck by the Ptolemies in mint outside Egypt. So uh, Ptolemies struck coins in Cyrenaica, in Cyprus, uh, in Syria and Phoenicia. And we usually don't find those coins in excavation. So it makes that all the coins that were found in Egypt were mostly the coins struck in the by the Alexandrian mint. So also, it also shows clearly that the closed money system was effective and the coins from outside the country did not circulate within the country. We can then look at the distribution of coins and what was clear and the main result of this research is that the the coins of series one and and two so the end of the fourth beginning of the third century were limited to the delta and next to alexandria you have very little from the south and very little from the from the fayum and after uh, the series three with when there is a big change so the change in two, uh, 261 or about this date is that tax payment are required in bronze coins so now people from the countryside has to pay in coins their their taxes and by this moment you see the coin the coinage spread within the country and develop itself in the country during the even during the second century even if there is a reduce of of, uh, of um, prediction of coins during this period and you see during uh, series nine that you also have pretty much within the country. But when you arrive to coin to Cleopatra, for example, uh, the monetization seems to shrink and came back around Alexandria and only in the Fayum and you have almost no coins of Cleopatra in South Egypt. So it's also interesting in terms of tax payments and how people were using the coins. And it means that if the pressure of the state was not too strong, People had a tendency outside the, the, the Greek, let's say, communities not to use the, the coins. We also have to, uh, to work on the archaeological bias that you have on the, on, on, the, um, on the sample, because it's really important to understand how the sample that I worked on was uh, representative. And uh, there is, of course, a big difference between what you find on the site and what you have on collection one example is here for, for example on site you have a lot of coins of nero uh, that you won't find on the, that you won't find on, on site even in the number are quite the same it's still a little bit different trajan adrian antonius pius and commodus are way more represented in the collections it was it, the, the work was done by Christiansen on the core collection by on 37 of the main collection with uh, Roman uh, with Roman coins and you see that the, the numbers for sites are different. It can be explained by the fact that uh, the Roman coins were mostly uh, collected because they are the wealth of iconographical types. So you had a lot of types and I here I, I show the coin entries on the Roman provincial coinage and, for example, you have very few number that's percentage, but you have a very few percentage of coins of Nero, even if you find them and they were produced in large quantities, but they were produced in large quantities in very few types, so they were less, I mean, uh, to be collected by by collectors and by museum. But if you enter Trajan, Adrian, Antonius de Bius, Pius, and Marcus Aurelius, you have a number of types. Like, for example, Adrian can, can struck maybe, I don't know, 30 different reverse types in one year. 
So of course, all the museum wanted to have this very coins and wanted to complete their collection. And by this, you find a lot more coins in the museum than the one you find you find on the site. There were also, um, as I show on the on the on the map, so this is clear on this graph, a clear difference on the material you find in Alexandria and on the Tebaid, for example, Tebaid, which is the south of Egypt, where in Alexandria you have a lot of coins of Augustus and Tiberius, even coins of Caligula, which is not very uh, um, numerous elsewhere. And in the rest of the of the South Egypt, you have very few Augustus and Tiberius, but a lot more coins from Claudius, uh, Nero, and Vespasian. We can show that on the on the map. You can see that the coins of Augustus were mostly found in the northwest uh, of Egypt, around Alexandria, and in the Fayum. And if you move to uh, if you move to Nero. It will spread into the into the the south, and under Vespasian, you can find it everywhere in the and everywhere in the in Egypt, and especially on this site of the standard art. I will come back um, on this. And on the Tonus Pius, you have also <coughs> coinage everywhere in in Egypt. The case of the uh, Eastern Desert is very interesting because it's. Uh, fortresses that were built uh, by Vespasian uh, in the in the mid uh, first century uh, BC, uh, AD and that were in which you find only certain types of coins so you find these kind of coins that are really really worn uh, usually and contrary to the rest of uh, of Egypt you have where you have different denomination but you can see by the size of these coins most of the coins you find in the Eastern Desert as are the one with this one, which are mostly the, the Diobors, which shows that there was use, I mean, only they use only a certain type that must have been related to the payment of the, uh, of the soldiers uh, in these fortresses and stayed for a very long time in the, in the Eastern Desert. That's the work uh, made uh, in the volume Money Rules by uh, uh, Hélène Cuvigny and Katarzyna Lach uh, that shows also and that's something that needs to be reminded and I, I always say that to the archaeologists working with me it's less the case for Ptolemaic Egypt but it's really important for Roman Egypt you have this case of coins of Augustus found in the, um, in the level dated by Austraca by mostly by not by the year but almost uh, from the second half of the second century but you also have coins of Claudius found uh, on deposit of the first half of the third century. So we have to still to remind us these coins were circulating one century, two century, maybe three centuries. And that when you find a coin in a layer, it doesn't mean that this layer dates from the very coin that you found inside. So I think it's a very good example that we really have to be careful about. And all the coins that we found from uh, Claudius in the Eastern Desert are ob obviously not coins that arrived in the Eastern Desert at the time of Claudius, but arrived at the time of Vespasian. So we have to keep that in mind. And when we are studying the motorization of the country, of course, it makes sense. And we have to deal with, with the fact that the coins can arrive 50, 100 years later than the time they were, they were produced. Another um, interesting uh, example of the, the army in, uh, in, in Egypt is this uh, pruta that we, we found in different sites. I say Bhutto because it's the, one of the sites I, I found the most. We found about eight of those coins, which were, of course, normally not, uh, they couldn't normally circulate within the country. But we found these coins in eight different layers uh, throughout the site of Bhutto. And when I start uh, searching for these coins, I found more in different sites in the in the delta. Some, of course, closer from uh, from uh, the uh, uh, the Sinai, so close from uh, from Syria and and, and from uh, from Judea. But uh, they are clearly a sign of some troops that were demobilized after the war and bring back their coins in Egypt, and apparently used it even if it was not really allowed they used it as tokens 
uh, at least um, when they arrived on site. And it's interesting because this discovery of Puta in military contexts are not a coin, um, I mean, the a fact that is only in Egypt, but you find this mostly on the Limes, uh, on, the, uh, of course, soldiers that were also demobil demobilized uh, and came back onto the onto their, their place of, let's say, work uh, in the rest of the empire. Um, a last example, it's uh, because, of course, when I'm working on monetarization, I also would like to know the context and where the, these coins were used. And one of the contexts that is cl really clears the, these coins for the bus, we know that people entering the bus asked to pay their fees to enter the bus. It was from the text, we know the very the lowest coins in circulation, so the lower denomination in circulation. We know that from, uh, from Papari. And we found sometimes in latrines, for example, for, for reasons I won't explain uh, here, and for the indicalizations of the bus, we found a lot of coins. Uh, and a lot of coins that we found are, are these really small coins from 10 or 12 millimeters that were completely overlooked uh, during the, the studies because they are usually in bad, bad state. Uh, but we found a lot of these coins in this context, meaning that they were used uh, for the entrance of, uh, of the bus uh, to pay a fee when they were entering the, um, entering the, the, the bus. Thank you for your attention. questions i'm ready all right i'll, I'll be happy to start off then. <laughs> okay um monetization is a uh, interesting word uh, because it can mean presumably coinization in the sense that uh, just a proliferation of coin use the, the, the question that i have really is how do you define monetization because you, you can think of um, a proliferation of coin use of bronze coinage at lower levels of transactions, while, say, middle level transactions using silver bill and coinage um, might not correspond necessarily to that type of monetization. And then at a higher level with gold, um, you might see uh, a different type of transaction. So at, at different levels, there might be a greater use of coins at different times. And, and so the, the question really is, when you're talking about overall monetization, are you talking about different levels of coin use at a particular moment that might evolve over time then? Um, so yeah, the, so the question of the monetization or the monetarization, uh, it's a very complex one. And of course, in my habitation, I, I, I spent a while trying to explain what I think about monetization because it's a term that it's completely, I mean, it's, it's not fixed in the, in the bibliography. People use monetization, monetarization as the same uh, meaning, which is clearly not the case, which is, in my case, I think monetar monetization is uh, where you put money instead of other commodities, where in the sense and the way I'm, I was working, monetarization is how most of the people in the country has access to coins. So it's really the development in coinage within the population, um, meaning that it's not only the elite that's dealing with silver and gold coins, but with the, the, the bronze coins, it's touching more and more people. And it's, I think, one of the results and I, what I'm, I'm advocating in, the, in, in my research is that the monetarization of Egypt took place in, for me, in two steps. In the third century BC, where the coins expand within within the country, but we see in the very end of the third century when the Tebaid was lost, that there is a shrinkage of the coinage. Which means that at that period exactly, people were not still used enough to coins to accept it and to use it when there was no need to use it or there were no pressure of the state to use it. But at the contrary, I think at the end of the third century and most likely in the first century, for example, when Cleopatra put 
let's say 70% of copper inside the silver coin, I think this is the monetization, it's pretty much complete because it means that at that moment, people are still using coins that have a fiduciary uh, value. And that's a big change because if you are able to use a coin as a token, like now, like there is no value, the only value is the one given by the state. I think that's a very big change. So I, I see these two steps. And for me, the monetarization is made way before the way before the Roman uh, the Roman period. And maybe there is a development, but I, I still we still have to discuss about that because the numbers I have are not the ones that have Christiansen and what he was debating for. But this monetarization for me took place very early in the in the Ptolemaic period at least. Thank you. We have we have a, a question here on the virtual side of things. Can you hear us all right virtually? Yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay. If you want to go ahead, Ali Reza, and ask your question. Hi, Thomas. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It is very good to see you after a, a few years now. I have actually two questions. One is following Peter's, and you're talking about monetization, and I understand that it is focused on coinage, but how about currencies before coinage, for instance, hack silver, or whether it was a money of account or store of value that in a way used barley or other commodities as a form of currency, then how far could we back, go back to discuss well, monetization in Egypt? That's my first question. And my second question is about, uh, you showed a slide about a hoard of bronze coins, and you said that this hoard was discarded. I'm very interested in this because usually when I hear discarded coins is usually a stray finds found archaeologically, not hoards found uh, discarded. So I'd be uh, grateful to hear your thoughts on these two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the first question is about uh, monetization before, uh, before coinage. Um, I would say that there are two questions in this. The, the first is how people were using lots of sorts of currencies within Egypt before the coinage. Uh, Axe silver, for example, Axe silver, there is, I think Axe silver is still used during the Ptolemaic period, even if we have coins everywhere in the country. So it's still something. Uh, there is exchange, of course, before the, before the, the, the coinage in Egypt, and it's I mean, pretty, pretty well known. Not many people have been working especially on that in the recent years so it would be nice to come back to that and to see what type of uh, commodities were really used as currencies and i think there is still quite a lot of, of work on, on about that and the second part is all the banking system because of course coins are one side of the one side of the coin i will say but the other the other the other side of the coin is is the is the banking and you have all these contracts uh, starting really early in the third century, and uh, some, some, um, someone like uh, Roussel, Ola Roussel, have been working on that uh, recently, and it shows that the banking system was really developed very early in the Ptolemaic period, and then developed even more during the Roman period. And we have to think that all the coins and all the exchanges were not in monet in coins, in but but add this value of banking, of contracts and everything. So I'm studying only the coinage part and the other part is, is really the banking, uh, the, the banking thing that needs to be, uh, needs to be reminded. Uh, for the, the second coin, it was the, for the second, uh, sorry, it was the hoard that I, I sh I've shown of uh, coins, try to get back to this, uh, of this very well-preserved, uh, Ptolemaic coins. Here it is. Sorry, I went too far. Uh, so this, the prime of coins in excavation is that people were you will use coins that were cleaned. And it's I did that uh, myself for a number of years, I was going to excavation and uh, the archaeologist uh, had some coins clean. I don't know if I could make it it's moving too fast. So uh whatever um but the these coins uh the, the problem is that if you do that you see maybe 10 maybe 20 maybe 50 percent of the coins that were actually excavated 
so I recently started to look at all the coins that could have come because there is a delay between when the coins were found and when they were cleaned. And uh, so it can be one, two, three, but it can be also 10 years. Um, and I have an example of Tep Tunis, for example, Olivier Picard was working on the coin. So give me when he when he finished the, the catalog, give me the catalog. So there is like about 1,500 coins, mostly Ptolemaic, coming from the site of Tep Tunis in the Fayum. And when I asked for the, the, the coins that were not clean, I I saw boxes and boxes and boxes are, came, came out. And I think that there are about 10,000 coins in these boxes. So the database that I have, like 1,500, is only a tiny part of the coins that were actually excavated. And the coins of this series nice that you can see on the screen now were produced in a huge, huge amount. And they were not uh, they were not registered and not clean because the state of preservation is really, really bad. Uh, so people in the past didn't re uh, re register it, but they were found in lots in a big and a lot of context. So they were apparently discarded. I still don't know when they were exactly discarded. If they were discarded at the beginning of uh, Cleopatra reign when the, she set up a reform of the coinage where you have this the, the value of the coins and if they were discarded at that moment of or if people were continue to use it during Cleopatra's reign and they, they finally discarded because they were not in use during the Roman period but it's clear that we have dozens and dozens of these hoards found in Egypt and that are not published not recorded and uh, even uh, thank you, Tomo. It does fascinate me how, why they would discard bronze because it could be melted and reminted, but um, that does make sense. But you have to you have to remind that these coins and especially the molded ones are in very very uh, bad condition because they are they, you have a lot of lead inside, and most of these coins are 30, 40, 50 percent lead. And so there is a lot of meteorological work if you want to take back the copper and, and remove the lead and everything. So for most of the people, it was completely useless and they just they just discarded. Doesn't mean that they didn't melt down a huge quantity of them, but we still have a, a lot of uh, a lot of discounts left. Thank you. Well, yep. Um, so as you noted on your map, pretty much all of the hoard finds that you discussed today are in Lower Egypt. Are there substantial hoard finds in Upper Egypt in the south, or is it the case that the influence of the Ptolemies and Rome didn't extend that far south and, and the pressure to use coinage didn't exist down there? Um, so the, yeah, the question is when the, I mean, where the coins uh, hoards are found. And, uh, and if we have some more in the Delta than in South Egypt, <clears throat> I would say it's a, it's a twofold question. It's uh, what coin horse that we recovered. When I say on the example, and it's uh, Ede was saying that in 1905, he was giving a list of the recently uh, hordes found in Egypt. And he was giving all the list of hordes of uh, gold and silver. And he said on the footnote, the coin sort of bronze are too numerous to be recorded. So it means that we have like hundreds of hoards that were discarded, melted. Datari said that he melted down one ton and a half of, uh, of coins in one day. So it means that a lot of these coins were melted. So the main point in, in the Delta, the work that I've been done, I've been done mostly, I mean, more likely on Greco-Roman settlements. So people were mostly interested in that period. If you go to uh, South Egypt, people were interested in temples. So it's Egyptologists. And if you go to Karnak, for example, uh, Chevrier, uh, French, I'm always taking the French, so I'm sure that nobody is saying that same bad, bad things about other nationalities. Chevrier in, in the 50s were saying that he cleaned the place in front of the, of the Karnak temple. There were a greek roman settlement and there was nothing recorded. In the 50s, nothing recorded because it was the echafaudage, so scaffolding for the pylon. And for him, it was greco roman so everything was removed. So, and he was, I think I saw in his report once, like, like all the hordes of uh, uh, Ptolemaic coins we found, it's only one type and, and it's removed. And it, we never found this coin. I don't know where the, the, the coins are right now. 
So there is this thing. It's like how it's always a question I ask myself: if the archaeological bias is not more important than the that the the discoveries themselves. So I would say yes that it's more likely that the the coin hoards are found in the delta, but you have to be careful because in the south of Egypt people were really not interested in coins and it's really likely that these words were not recorded properly. Is there any question? I don't see the, ch I see uh, there is the chat, sorry, I didn't check. Okay, no question in the, in the chat. I have one uh, question. Uh, you had said that you didn't think Roman gold circulated in Roman Egypt. So would they have just used the villain and the bronze or um, and just not function without gold? Or what was the scenario there? I mean, that's a debated question. And and uh, and because, I mean, that's uh, speaking that uh, the circulation of gold in Egypt for people in the on, on Zoom. Um, it's a complicated question, and, and if uh, someone like Andrew Burnett thinks that gold may have circulated in Egypt, makes me very uh, cautious when I'm speaking about these kind of things. I would say that the gold coins during the Ptolemaic period were stopped to circulate in like 140, for example. So it means that for the rest of the period of the Ptolemaic uh, times, like more than 100 years, there were no gold circulating in Egypt. So when Augustus arrived in Egypt, there were no gold circulating. And I think they just kept what he was working at that, at that moment. There is also something to take into consideration is during the Ptolemaic period, at least during the third and second century, you had the gold mines in the Eastern Desert that were working. So they had primary source of gold in Egypt that were used for coinage. During the Roman period, it, the shift were to uh, to Spain for gold mines, and uh, after that to uh, to to Romania and to, to these places. So they didn't have this primary resource for for gold. So bringing gold to to Egypt to strike it maybe was not a good I mean good, a good idea or was not efficient or was not meaningful for them. But I would say that considering the very few number of hordes that was been that has been found in Egypt, uh, we would need to work more on the context. But most of them have been found in, in the nine of the nineteenth century, beginning of the twenties. So it's really hard to to know more about the context. But I would I would think, and considering the amount, the large amount of beyond coins that have been produced, that they were actually working without I mean, dealing without the the coins that that's my opinion and from what i know from excavation i think i would find at least single finds if you're using coins you have single finds and i don't know any single find of roman uh, aureus in in egypt so i would stick to the idea that, that the roman coin was not legally circulating in egypt All right, well, thank you again. Let's give Dr. Prochet another round of applause. Thank you. Let's just start another five years before we see you again here. <laughs> so. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.